This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. This episode is of paramount importance. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. You can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics, on iTunes, or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. The second of our movie studio histories covers a company that went through multiple iterations, mergers, breakdowns, and takeovers, Paramount Pictures. We begin in 1912, and famous players film company, founded by Adolf Zukor, who made his career investing in Nickelodeons, the periscope-like viewer with a hand crank, not the cable network. His plan was to make films using big names in the legitimate theater, which would appeal to the working class who couldn't afford to go see a play. Sarah Bernhardt was one of his first stars. Meanwhile, producer Jesse L. Lasky had started Lasky Feature Play Company using money he got from his brother-in-law, Samuel Goldfish. If you don't recognize the name, he later changed it to Goldwyn. He signed up a stage director with no film experience named Cecil B. DeMille for their first feature. Both studios began to distribute through a third company called Paramount Pictures Corporation. This was the first attempt to sell films nationally. Up to that point, you went through distributors at the state level. Paramount was also making their own pictures, including a series of Jack London films. By 1916, Zucor and Lasky merged, then bought out the Paramount owner to create... Famous Players Lasky Corporation. Zucor wanted big stars and he got them, signing up Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks, Gloria Swanson, Rudolph Valentino, among others. He also introduced block booking, which forced exhibitors to buy a year's worth of films up front if they wanted to get those big stars. And that will create problems down the line, as we'll see. Zucor also built a chain of almost 2,000 theaters under Publix Theater Corporation, ran studios in California and New York, and invested in early radio. At one point, he owned 50% of the nascent CBS, not the last time Paramount and CBS would meet. The studio's name changed to Paramount Famous Lasky Corporation in 1926, then Paramount Publix Corporation a year later. Another acquisition involved theaters, the Balaban and Katz Theater chain. They would become a major part of the management structure. And by the way, the actor Bob Balaban is related to both Balaban and Katz. They developed what were called Wonder Theaters, massive movie palaces in Chicago. An attempt to expand this to New York City started a fight with the Lowe's chain, which was owned by MGM, and they eventually agreed to stay out of each other's towns. It was around this time that two series of films began. Inkwell Imps, the early animation work of Fleischer Studios, which would later bring Betty Boop, Popeye, and Superman, and The Paramount News, a newsreel program that would run into the late 50s. They moved into Talkies in 1929 with Innocence of Paris featuring Maurice Chalvier. All this expansion led to Zucker being overextended just as the Great Depression hit. The company went into receivership and by 1935, Barney Balaban was president while Zucker had been bumped up to chairman. This is also when it officially became known as Paramount Pictures Incorporated. Paramount continued to emphasize stars into the talkies era, including Mae West, W.C. Fields, Claudette Colbert, the Marx Brothers, Dorothy L'Amour, Bing Crosby, Gary Cooper. And by the mid-30s, the studio was cranking out 60 to 70 films a year because they had all of those theaters to fill up. Speaking of those, the government decided in the 40s that maybe pre-booking films a year in advance, plus having your own huge theater chain, was a problem. The lack of guaranteed pre-sales forced Paramount to go from 70 to 20 films a year. The United States vs. Paramount Pictures Supreme Court 1948 decision made it illegal for a studio to own a theater chain, kind of like how Universal owns Comcast today. Mm. <laughs> the theater, theater chain was spun off and became United Paramount Theaters, headed by Leonard Goldenson, who was already running that part of the business. He had a lot of money from the downtown real estate of movie theaters and couldn't invest legally in films. So he turned to the new medium of television, buying ABC in 1953 mm. and making them a going concern. Speaking of TV, Paramount had invested in early experiments in L.A. and Chicago, the former eventually becoming KTLA and the latter WBBM. They also bought a stake in Dumont. By 1948, they ran their own regional TV network, Paramount Television, alongside Dumont. This became problematic when they wanted to buy more stations. The FCC said the existing networks together had hit their limit, and so they were allowed no more. This led to both concerns losing ground to CBS, NBC, ABC, 
and was a factor in the end of the Dumont network. With the loss of a theater chain, Paramount went into a decline, as did the other studios, dropping the number of studio-produced films over distribution of independent efforts. They also released their contract players, which together effectively ended the studio system. Paramount also made a terrible decision. Their film library, they decided, ah, oh, we don't really, really need it, little value. So they sold all their pre-1948 works to what would become Universal Television in 1958. And this included the bulk of the Bing Crosby, Bob Hope road pictures that had kept Paramount afloat for years. By the 60s, Paramount was hemorrhaging money and did little to change course. Zucker was Chairman Emeritus, despite being in his 90s, while Chairman Balaban was in his 80s. Industrial conglomerate Gulf and Western bought out Paramount in 1966, and new chair Charles Bloodham put unknown producer Robert Evans in charge of production. This led to films such as The Odd Couple, Rosemary's Baby, Love Story, The Godfather, Chinatown, and Three Days of the Condor. So, Golf and Western then bought Desilu Studios the next year. Of course, that was created by Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, who had an impressive set of TV content. Star Trek, Mission Impossible, and The Untouchables, all of which would go on to various successes in film and TV. Paramount used this existing relationship with TV networks to become a major TV production company, especially in sitcoms. And by the mid-70s, a group of execs came in with TV experience. Mm -hmm. Barry Diller, Michael Eisner, Jeffrey Katzenberg, all of whom would go on to run other studios. They had high-concept films like Saturday Night Fever and Grease. Diller was pushing the idea of a fourth TV network called Paramount Television Service in the late 70s. It didn't come to fruition at the time, but Diller took it later to Fox, where they made it work a decade later. By the 90s, Paramount finally tried it with UPN, now merged with the WB into the CW, using a new Star Trek series, Voyager, as, they, as their flagship. Now, they had already hit syndication pay dirt with TNG mm -hmm. and DS9. Back to the movie studio, where the 80s and early 90s went very well for Paramount. Airplane. American Gigolo. Ordinary People. An Officer and a Gentleman. Flashdance. Terms of Endearment. Footloose. Pretty in Pink. Top Gun. Crocodile Dundee. Fatal Attraction. Ghost. And the franchises for Friday the 13th, Eddie Murphy, and Star Trek. They also divested themselves of all the industrial parts of G&W, renaming it Paramount Communications. They still had a range of companies in music, cable TV, publishing, and ironically, movie theaters, but in Canada. Mm -hmm. There were also TV stations and amusement parks involved at one point. 1994 brought a buyout of Paramount by Viacom, ironically started by CBS to syndicate TV shows, then later bought up CBS itself. The combined companies then split into two companies in 2006. Viacom would own Paramount Pictures and cable networks such as Comedy Central, MTV, VH1, Nickelodeon. While CBS Corporation owned CBS, Paramount's TV arm, and the publishing business. This resulted, among other things, to split Star Trek into movies owned by Viacom and television owned by CBS. And this is why we now have a Kelvin universe based on the rebooted film franchise alongside the classic Trek universe on TV, where Star Trek Discovery is based. Neither can use each other's concepts. Hmm. <laughs> there have been talks about remerging Viacom and CBS together again, but this was held off by Les Moonves, who until recently was CBS chair. The recent allegations of sexual misconduct by Moonves got him kicked out, and it was agreed to hold off merger talks for two years. Assume a merger will occur in the early 2020s. Oh, and the Paramount logo, the original Paramount president, W.W. Hodkinson, sketched it while in a meeting with Adolf Zucker back in 1914. The 24 Stars Over the Mountain was based on their existing contracts at the time with 24 actors. It's mm. kind of interesting. Yeah. Well, while you're thinking about that, you can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics, on iTunes or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. Thanks for watching.